Hello, folks. Dennis Martin Gillen here, and welcome to the director's cut of my very own TEDx talk. So what you have is Dennis Gillen talking about Dennis, Dennis Gillen, and you're probably thinking to yourself, why? Dennis Gillen? That's kind of self-serving. No, 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 not at all. I'm doing this video because I want to encourage each of you to do a TEDx talk. Everybody has a story in them. Everybody. And I'm going to tell you how I got on the TEDx Hickory stage in hopes of inspiring you to do the same. So here we go. I'll tell you how I got there. There it is, TEDx Hickory. I got to minimize this a little bit and show you the woman that made it happen. That's Debbie Shannon. Her website's. Oh, hey, there we go. It already started. We're going to pause that. Debbie Shannon. She was a volunteer and still is, I see, for TEDx Hickory. She called me up. She goes, Dennis, you have quite the story. You should at least apply to be a speaker at TEDx. Now, in the past, I thought about this hard, and I applied here in Greenville, South Carolina, where I live, and I decided um, their schedule, their practice sessions, I couldn't make some of the practice sessions, so I pulled out. Now, it gets really interesting here. Um, when she approached me about TEDx Hickory, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do this out of town. This way, if I bombed, nobody would know this. And I've done this before. I've done stand-up comedy before. And I did it in Charlotte, an hour and a half away from here, in case I bombed, which I did, and nobody saw it. Uh-huh. There you go. Open mic night. Go far away. Come home. You know, no muss, no fuss. No harm, no foul. Nobody saw it. I checked it off the bucket list. Done. This talk, uh, everyone's going to see it. We're going to see it together. I want to go over the uh, the director's cut here, but I wanted to thank Debbie for pushing me. She was my mentor, and some would say she was my tormentor. She said, you ought, to, you, know, you ought to apply. She told me how to do it. I'll tell you right now, one, you send in a video clip and a written synopsis of what you want to cover. At the time, I had gone through a divorce and moved from a really big house to a really small apartment. How small? Uh, less than 700 square feet, maybe 650 tops. Walk-in kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, couch. That's it. If I put the key in too far to the door, I broke the back window. I mean small. I mean small. So Debbie pushed me. She's an executive coach. If you need some executive coaching, I cannot recommend anyone higher than Debbie. She's the best. Now, I go to Hickory. We have practiced the day before. This is on a Saturday at Lenore Ryan University. We practice Friday. You have to do a walkthrough. Once I was accepted, and I was. Um, we practice Friday and Saturday we go live. And during practice, I kind of walked through it. I had notes, didn't do my best job. It's Friday night, went out to eat, had my lovely girlfriend with me, Christine, now my wife. Um, I wasn't feeling it. I'm like, I don't think I'm ready. This is 17 minutes and I memorized it all. Memorized it all. I didn't want to do my typical death by PowerPoint, you know, 54 slides. I didn't want to do my keynote talk. I wanted to do something totally different. And I took on the topic of loneliness and it's all related to mental health. It all comes back. So that night in the hotel, um, Christina and I, uh, we went out and you'll see, I bought a shirt at Steinmart. That's the shirt I wear. Um, RIP Steinmart, no longer in business. And I wake up the mor next morning, seriously, about 4.35 o'clock. She's asleep. I just go downstairs and go, I don't think I'm ready for this. And I'm in the hotel writing notes, like you're studying for an exam. You just got to rewrite it, rewrite it, rewrite it. And in this TEDx talk, I have to go over um, 10 ways to combat loneliness, all memorized. Everything's memorized. I use maybe four, five slides max, max. So let's get into it. I'm going to walk out on stage. I had a great position, by the way. I was number three of nine, three of nine. And by the way, all the talks were awesome that day. So if, if you don't want to do a TEDx, Go to a TEDx. They were awesome. I was in position three and I loved it because I, I got to watch the first person go. And then um, I had to go out in the hallway. The second person went and then I went and I wanted to go early. I did not want to have to sit around after lunch and go through this thing at all. I did not want that to happen. So let's take a look. I'll interrupt the, uh, the video every now and then. If you see me turning my head, I'm watching it on two screens. I'll come back and look at you all. But this is Dennis Gillen, director's cut for his TEDx talk. And I want you to do one. So here we go. I'll come over here. 
I'm about to walk out. We got to thank our sponsors. There we go. Let's try this. Stop it right there. You heard it. A big, you know, they just introduced me, and I kid you not, I don't think I'm ready. I don't think I'm ready. I am, you probably could have put a piece of coal in my sphincter and had a diamond at the end of this thing. Super nervous. And there is a shirt. Ah! There is a shirt from Steinmart. Looks good. That scared me. Um, pants look good. The shoes were by my sister. Look down now right there. There's two monitors. Two monitors. There's no cheat sheet here. One monitor has the time and the other monitor has uh, the slides. There's only four or five of them. So one, how long you're up there? 16, 17 minutes. And the other one, the slides. Here we go. I know two guys that died alone. And I have a big fear. I do not want to die alone. So I found it somewhat ironic that I was in my apartment alone watching a Japanese documentary called Dying Alone. <laughs> There's an irony there. The intro was kind of rough. The Japanese take two words and they mash them together. It's called kodokushi, or dying alone, solitary death. I kind of blow it here. I will tell you when I hit my stride. There's a there's a distinct point where I hit my stride and I, you'll know exactly when it is. The beginning, I'm all over the board. And when I say I mean I had to watch it, I meant this had subtitles. You couldn't turn on the, you know, you couldn't turn on the movie and go like empty the dishwasher. You had to watch this documentary called Dying Alone. It, it, this documentary went on to say, maybe it's a Japan problem, but I mean, I had to watch it. I really had to watch it. They lose three people an hour in Japan to what they call kodokushi, or lonely death. And when I say I had to watch it, I don't know if you guys know this. There's a little bit of knowledge. This is why we come to these conferences. The people in Japan speak Japanese. <laughs> so it had subtitles. I should have paused a little bit for the laughter. And initially, what I want to do whenever I speak such a tough sub subject. I have to relive the two worst days of my life um, with the loss of Matt and Mark. Um, but you want to introduce humor into it, humor, in the hopes that you know you disarm the audience. A lot of people come into my talk with their arms crossed. They don't want to be there. They have to be there. I've been told by management they have to be there, and they don't want to be there. So what we're trying to do is disarm them a little bit. So here we go. Little humor, very little emphasis on little. I really had to watch it. I learned a lot watching this, and it was sad because the opening, the opening scene, they were cleaning this apartment of this gentleman, and they, they recognized that maybe he was gone for close to seven to 10 days, and nobody noticed. And I was sitting there going, well, that won't happen to me. I have two kids. And then I realized this guy had family too. And you know what happens? I thought of the old adage, uh, what happens when two people are in charge of feeding the horse? The horse dies of starvation because the one person thought the other one would do it. I could see my boys doing that right now. I thought you were going to call dad. I thought you were going to call dad. Where's dad? You know? Okay, little humor. They're coming with me. We got to get this thing flowing. Still super nervous. Not sure where this is going. Um, but so far, so good. It's, it's me testing the waters and they're, they're with me. So I started thinking, maybe that's just a, a, a Japanese problem. So I continued my research, and I went around the globe. I ended up in a place called the United Kingdom. The Kingdom. And recently, recently, 2018, Prime Minister Theresa May appointed at a cabinet-level position the Minister of Loneliness. That's how much she thinks about this. This is a brilliant Kind of blew that a little bit. I should have said then Prime Minister uh, May, because she was not Prime Minister at the time. It was Boris Johnson. And I should have said that's how much she is interested in this topic. Or that this is how much I said that's how much she thinks about it. That's not what I wanted to say. I still don't know what I want to say, but still fumbling and bumbling. But we'll get there. So far, so good. Move. She used the word epidemic. And the, in, in, the words are not lost on me in the United Kingdom. And I know this is ripe for satire. I can see it almost sounds like a Monty Python skit, doesn't it? Hello, I'm the Minister of Loneliness. 
Where's my office? Oh, Minister of Loneliness, you do not have an office. We have a shed out back. That's where you'll be working. Okay, where will I put my employees? Oh, Minister of Loneliness, you do not have any employees. <laughs> so I'm working in a shed out back with no employees. Sounds like I will be lonely. Sounds like you are perfect for the job. You, know, <laughs> you can see it. It almost sounds like that. I took improv classes, and I still suck at comedy, but I tried. And it does sound like a Monty Python skit, but I'm still trying to break it down, and it's going to get serious. Remember how I opened up the talk. I know two guys that died alone. We're going to come back to those two guys uh, later. But it's really not that funny if you think about it. Because I continued this journey around the globe, and guess where I ended up? USA, USA, the United States of America. Now, we don't have that problem here. We all get along swimmingly, right? <laughs> Thank you, you detected the sarcasm. So during my research, I looked up two big companies. Cigna, the healthcare company, paired up with this company called Ipsos, research data-driven company, and they did a survey of 20,000 Americans on this topic. And using the UCLA, UCLA loneliness scale, spoiler alert, if you have a loneliness scale, you probably have an issue with loneliness, right? All right, I sort of blew that line, UCLA. I just couldn't get it out. You know, you get tongue-tied. But this part of the presentation, I had, to re I had to memorize four key statistics. Memorize. Again, teleprompter not helping. And I think I do okay here. And this is the stuff I was doing in the morning in the hotel, writing down these stats. I had to get it right because anybody could fact check me. It's printed. It's, uh, it's on the interweb. 46% of us, four points, 46% of us felt alone. Sometimes or always. 46%, folks, that's almost half. One out of four or 27% feel like nobody understands them. Two out of five, now we're back in the 40s, feel like their relationships have no meaning or are not meaningful. 43% of us. And then I read this other bullet point. I said, hey, that's pretty good. 53% of us have in person daily social interactions. And then I read it again, and it said only 53% of us. So the converse of that is 47% of us do not. Okay, I got awfully quiet in here. You were real happy. Acknowledge the elephant in the room. It got really quiet in the room. I was going with the stats. I know it's a lecture, but it got like really quiet. So if that happens to you, Pointed out, and that's what I did right here. I got, I pointed it out, like, wow, it got really quiet because these are some dire statistics about loneliness. So, come right at them. That's my coaching for you. Come right at them. If you feel it's getting quiet, that's an ad lib line right there. Say, so, hey, it got really quiet in here. Happy when I was picking on those other countries, right? <laughs> this kind of hits home, and it hits home to the point where our former Surgeon General took notice of this. Vivek Murthy, MD, MBA, LMNOP. He's got more degrees than a thermometer. Smart man. He's our top doc, was our top doc. He used the same terminology Theresa May did. He called it an epidemic. And then he said something I thought was sort of odd, but it made sense after I further investigated. He said, this loneliness issue is not an epidemic that is occurring in isolation. I'm sitting there going, we're talking about loneliness, right? It sort of does occur in isolation. But he said, no, it affects all of us the tribe that is the United States of America. Little fun fact about our Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, M-U-R-T-H-Y. He was our, at the time of this, I gave this talk, he was not our Surgeon General. He was a Surgeon General under Obama, uh, was not Surgeon General under Trump, and when Biden got in office, he was Surgeon General again. And I like the guy. I'm not going to get political, please, but he does talk about loneliness. He talks about mental health. I like the dude. Um, I like our top doc in the United States talking about mental health issues, no matter what party he's affiliated with. Impacts us all. Now, he got involved in this because of the health benefit or the, the detrimental health effects. And our, our whole thing is about connecting. Our whole theme here in Hickory is about connecting. So I could do a whole talk. The theme 
for this particular TEDx talk, they have a, they actually have a t-shirt that says it's called Connect. The theme was Connect. And I botched that line a little bit. I could have clarified. The people knew in the audience know why they're there because it was all over the place. Connect, connect, connect. But the online audience doesn't know that. So I'm clarifying that. The theme for this TEDx was Connect. On the detrimental health effects of loneliness. But all we have to know for today, for the purpose of today, all we have to know is loneliness is the new smoking. Loneliness is the new smoking. And here's another tip. So far we learned that the folks in Japan speak Japanese. Here's a little medical advice for you. If you're going to smoke, do not smoke alone. Smoke in a group. You'll get the first hand smoke, you'll get the second hand smoke, you'll get human interaction. It's all good. Do not smoke alone. I hope you guys are writing this down. This is knowledge, it's coming right up. I only have so much here, people. But that's the health, the health effect. So when I started talking to people, and I talked to people daily, you heard in the introduction, I'm a, a mental health advocate with an emphasis on suicide prevention. And I started asking people, usually my age, I said, what do you think is causing this, you know, the increase in your loneliness in America? And you know what they often do? They point to, they point to social media. Everybody points to social media, but this was happening way before social media. Um, we had this issue. So it's a big component. We're watching the effects now. Young girls, there's a ton of studies about Instagram and young girls. I believe there's a real bad influence of social media. But after I went on at this TEDx talk, a woman got up there and talked about how she documented her journey through cancer with social media. And that's a positive effect. So just depends who you're following, right? Right off the bat, they go, social media, social media, social media. Folks, my generation. Then I have to think about those, those older folks in Japan. They're not really big consumers of social media. So it's more than that. But enough people said it that I started to investigate it. And I went to the Googler and I typed in loneliness and social media. Boom, 38 million hits in less than a second. I'm like, wow, I guess it's a thing. One of the articles I started scrolling through, one of the articles had a gentleman by the name of Paul Angone. He does a, a blog called All Grown Up. He's talking about his transi transition from his teens, 20s, to 30s, and he uses the word grown, G-R-O-A-N, all grown up. See what he did there? It's called adulting. And he's talking about this transition. He coined a phrase, and there's a medical serious medical condition called obsessive compulsive disorder. Have you all heard of that? Serious medical condition. I never want to be flippant during my talk to anyone who's suffering with a serious mental illness. And, you know, if it's your mental illness, they're all serious. I wanted to convey that. Uh, and hopefully that came across. It, I never, ever, when I speak, want to, um, I don't use words like you're crazy and all that stuff. I just want to honor those who are suffering because a lot of people in the audience are vulnerable and are suffering. So, I think I handled that okay. We call it OCD. It's real and it exists. Using those same letters, he came up with another, uh, he coined another term for OCD, obsessive comparison disorder. That's when we start going through and scrolling and looking at all these, hey, they're on a cruise. Hey, check out their cheeseburger. We're taking pictures of food now, people. Uh, this is also known as FOMO, F-O-M-O, -O, fear of missing out. And you start to get anxious, and you start to get depressed, and you volunteered for this. You went on there by yourself, and I could see this. And then the anxious and depression, knowing what I do on a daily basis, will lead to withdrawal and isolation. And now we're coming down to our bucket here, loneliness, at a conference called with a theme of Connect. So I continued my research, and I saw one word that popped out at me. It was the word combat, how to combat loneliness. Like, oh, that's an article I need to read. I just want to come, don't want to come to Hickory and say, hey, we have a problem with loneliness. Good night, everybody. You know, we, have, we need some solutions. And Ruben Castaneda, in US News and World Report, posted nine ways to combat. Ruben Castaneda actually tweeted the, this TEDx talk out, super guy. I sort of pick on him here, and I regret that, because he, he gave us nine things for, uh, ways to combat loneliness. I said, hey, you couldn't come up with one more. Kind of a gentle ribbing. The guy turns out to be a super guy. So Ruben, my apologies if you're out there. Loneliness. And I'm sitting there going, you couldn't come up with one more? You know, the top 10 list, you just, you couldn't. I found one, I'll give it to you. It's a bonus. Thank you for showing up today. The first one is see people in real life. When I went through a stressful life event recently, and we'll call it a divorce because that's what it was, I moved an hour and a half away. You guys are laughing at the demise of my marriage. Thank you. 
That's it. That's the point. We're at 8.53 into a 17-minute presentation that I started to feel comfortable. I'm about to go through this top 10 list, and I have them memorized. I feel pretty good, and I have these little prompts in my head to go through it. But that's the point where the audience laughed. I ad-libbed, and I'm sitting there going, all right, we're all together. We're on the same page, and it's, it's starting to flow. It happens. I moved an hour and a half away, and I found myself alone. So I went to social media. This is where it's good. And I found a hiking club. And I had to sign up for a hike. I had to go to a parking lot and meet people I did not know. I had to get in somebody's car, and we drove to the mountains of Western North Carolina. I know, it sounds like a horror movie, right, at the beginning. <laughs> and we never saw them again. Um, no, it was a wonderful day. It was an awesome day. So that's it, see people in real life. Number two, smile and say nice things. Smile and say nice things. I recently had a mundane uh, transaction occur. I was paying a toll on the highway. And I have this pat line that I always use when I want to interact with somebody. I gave the guy my money. I was waiting for my change. And I said, I can't wait till tomorrow, hoping that he would bite. And he goes, hey, what's tomorrow? I said, I have no idea, but I get better looking every day. Ah. <laughs> he laughed because it was funny. I almost cried because I know it's not true. Um, <laughs> But we interacted. A little side note on that line, by the way. I hope you steal it, but a little side note. Never try that with flight attendants. <laughs> I walked on a plane one time. I tried it, a late night flight. I said, oh, I can't wait till tomorrow, hoping she'd bite. She goes, what's tomorrow? I said, I don't know. I get better looking every day. She looked at me without blinking and said, I'm glad I didn't see you yesterday. <laughs> oh. That was a kind way of saying, sit down and shut up. <laughs> True story, I got served on the flight. These people are professional people handlers. She had had enough, it was a late night flight and she just kindly said in her own way, sit down and shut up. I got served, it was awesome. <laughs> Number three on the list, walk interactively. Take the headphones out, talk and walk to people, say hello, walk downtown Hickory, look in the windows, say hi to people, freak them out, say how you're doing to total strangers. Four is exactly that. Reduce the number of strangers in your life. Introduce yourself. One less stranger. The minute you introduce yourself to someone, that's one less stranger in your life. Number five, use your smartphone as a phone. How about that? Dial it up, kids. Dial it up. FaceTime's even better. You get to see the person. Use it. Number six, sign up for a class. I signed up for an improv class when I moved. Wouldn't it be great? We're at a university today. Wouldn't it be great? At, at one of the breaks, we all went over to the admissions counselor and said, we'd like to sign up for a class today. It would make her day. Number seven. True story. I did sign up for an improv class. Back to the apartment after the divorce. It was lonely. It was like winter time. I think I moved in in November and quickly December came and the cold and the darkness came and I signed up for an improv class. One of the best things I ever did. Again, not for everybody. You have to come out of your comfort level. Signed up and Monday nights, we had uh, at a local high school, we had classes and I would go and then we'd go out to eat afterwards. So every Monday night for about eight weeks, I knew exactly what I was going to do. It was great being with people. It was just great. Seven, visit somebody that's lonely. Visit someone that's lonely. Remember this, a stick alone can be broken by a child, but a stick in a bundle cannot be broken. And we say, well, Dennis, I don't know anyone who's lonely. Folks, we have nursing homes full of lonely people. Visit someone that's lonely. Number eight, and I'm a big fan of this, if you get stuck, visit a therapist. I've had really good insurance in my life. I had lousy insurance in my life. I had paid cash money to go see my therapist. If you're stuck, go see a professional. No shame, no stigma in that. Number nine, take baby steps. Congratu congratulate yourself on doing the simple things of life. Like today, we came to this conference. We got out of bed. How about that? Give yourselves a round of applause for that. Right. Not too much. You have to save something when I leave. My fragile male ego. That's so true, though, for in life, baby steps. Congratulate yourself for doing little things. You can lower expectations. You know, for some folks suffering depression, uh, I remember after Matt died, if I got up out of bed before noon, it was a good day.
Those two weeks I was off from work were brutal. I laid around, did nothing all day. I was so, so bummed out. So if I got up before noon, I congratulated myself. Yeah, that's a good day. So spot on there. Take that advice. Treat yourself like a child. Congratulate yourself with the little things. And number 10, and this is the bonus one, is volunteer for something. Volunteer for something. This conference exists today because of wonderful volunteers. At the end of the day, there's a whole list of things you can do when you volunteer. The last one that really got me is it says it makes you happy. It makes you happy. You're glad. Quick note on volunteering, too. You could also be voluntold. You know, when someone signs you up for something like, hey, we're going to go build you know, at work. They say, hey, we're going to do this thing for Habitat for Humanity, and you don't want to do it, and you go anyway. And it, it, studies have shown that even when you're forced to volunteer, you get this positive psychological benefit, and you know what I'm talking about. You don't want to do it. You go, and then you get back in the car, and you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad I did that. Huge, huge psychological benefit to volunteering. Glad you did it. So that's some of the things we can do to combat loneliness. And I'm going to give you two challenges. First challenge, you have to do it today, today. While you're here, you have to go up to a total stranger, somebody you do not know at this conference, and you have to say, how do you think the talks are going? Somebody you don't know. Do not cheat. I will know. <laughs> and you have to realize, well, if you're the recipient of that question, that person just left their comfort zone. You owe them grace and a response. If you have trouble peopling and you need a response, I'll help you out. Just say, hey, I think the talks are going really great. That Dennis Gillen guy was awesome. <laughs> All right, that was a selfish plug, but somebody did come up to me. It was hilarious. After I was done speaking, we had lunch. Some guy came up and he goes, how do you think the talks are going? And we kind of laughed. And I said, I think they're awesome. By the way, they were all awesome. Um, they were nine for nine on that day, that unbelievable talks. Good dollar if you say that. I appreciate it. So that's the one challenge. The second challenge I want you all to do is find a group of people and break bread with them. We all have that in common. We love food. I told you I lived in an apartment building. An apartment building is kind of cool. It's a, it's a bunch of people in transition in life. There's a whole group of young folks that are just entering the professional workforce. It's really cool to watch. There's a bunch of kids in my building the other day studying for the CPA exam. I'm like, go, kids, go. Good luck to you. Fly. Be free. And then I run into this group. This is a group of men that are in my building, and we're all different stages of life. And we picked. I say we picked. I picked. And I said, guys, we've got to start meeting off-site and having breakfast together. So we pick the second and fourth Thursday of every month. We sit around and have breakfast. It's, it's unbelievable. It's just, all we have is a meal, no agenda. Somebody sends out a text, and there we go. I wish I took a picture from last week, because last week, instead of the four or five of us, there was eight of us, which tells me there's an appetite for this stuff. People really want to get together. Now, I don't know much about these guys. We just, we're all in different phases of life. I'll go around the horn. I know Tom's from Wisconsin, Will's from Illinois, Jim's from Kansas City, and Barry talks funny. We think he's from England. It could be Australia. We don't know. <laughs> that group still meets, to tell you the truth, and we have a name. It's the Camo Hat Club, as in camouflage. And the reason we call it the Camo Hat Club is uh, men tend to camouflage their emotions, right? So the Camo Hat Club, we went right through COVID. We went right through. We used to meet outside. And small world. This is a small world. The guy I pointed to, Will Raisby, is from Illinois. I used to live in Illinois. And he is in IT for a publisher. And I knew one guy that was in IT for a publisher. And I said, Will, do you know Rob Riccio? And he said, yeah, I took his job. When Rob left, I filled his spot. They worked together. Small world. Be nice to everybody. Now, this group still meets the first Thursday. It's not really high tech. All we do is the first Thursday, we someone sends out, usually on a Wednesday, because we're guys, no, we don't plan very well. Someone goes, hey, are we doing that breakfast tomorrow? And there's like 18 guys on this chain. Seriously, four, three, five, six will show up. We never know. There's your regulars, and then you know, people come in. One time this guy showed up, and it was interesting because he was going through a rough period. He was a new guy. And we all said, well, how'd you end up in the apartment building? He goes, well, I, um, I'm going through a divorce. Little did he know, he, three out of the four of us at that table had gone through a divorce. So brother, come on in.
Let us know. And he showed up recently again, and he looks much better. The first time he didn't look so good, it's rough. Been there, done that. And something, you know, the dust is starting to settle. And he came to the breakfast recently. He looks a lot better. I've been there. I know exactly what's going through. It was kind of cool uh, that, you know, to see this happening. Men need men. So women, don't be mad at me. You have the, uh, what is it, the Red Hat Club. So men, we have the Camo Hat Club. And you need to start a group. I'll get back to you on that. But remember why we're here today. Connect. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you an assignment. You have to do that. Long after the glow of this wonderful conference is over, you need to do this. You need to do this. We need to connect. We are wired. We are wired to connect with other people. Remember, this is a guy coming from a guy who sat through in his apartment watching a video called Dying Alone. We need eat. I almost blew it right there. I almost said, Remember, this is a guy who lost two brothers to suicide. Remember, the audience doesn't know that yet. In my normal talk, I get my brothers out of the way early. I talk about Mark, I talk about Matt, and then we go on to like risk factors, warning signs, and they're out of the way. That's more of an issue with self-preservation. In this particular talk, I left them to the end, and you're going to start to see me slowly die on stage. You may not... Detect it, but boy, oh boy, I could feel it. Um, and watch at the end when I run off the stage. Each other. We need each other. So let's, let's think about this. How did I start my talk today? How did I start? I said, I know two guys that died alone. Some of you said, no, oh, the Japanese documentary. No, before that, when I walked out, I said, I know two guys that died alone. Here they are. I have something in common with these guys. Our last name. Our parents. These are my brothers. It's Mark and it's Matthew. We lost both of those guys to suicide. Folks, now you know what I do every day. In America, the United States of America, we lose 47,173 people a year to suicide, which may be the ultimate and most fatal symptom of loneliness. Perceived or real, and remember, perception is reality. That's one person every 11 minutes. 129 a day. Do you see why we need each other? Do you see why we need each other? Folks, when I walked out here, I said, I don't want to die alone. There's no real truth in that statement. I thought I did. And when I started preparing for this talk, I got really introspective as the week went on, as we got closer to this date to come here to talk to you guys. It's not that I'm afraid of dying alone. No, not at all. The real fact is, I don't want to live alone, and I don't want you to either. Again, and my brother's gets me all the time. I am crying. It's my talk, and it gets me every time because of Matt and Mark. It just does. Um, I'm going to give myself an A for the ending because even though it was rough, I pulled it together here. It got quiet. I was somewhat poised, I think. But I do want you to detect. I just said the line. I said, I don't want to die alone. But what it really boils down to is I don't want to live alone, and I don't want you to either. And... I should have stuck around. This is where I made a big mistake. Watch me bolt off stage. I am going to run for the door. The door is right off there. You can see the exit sign. I'm going to head for it. I am done. I'm cooked. Um, this happens all the time when I do the talk. I'm toast. And I should have stuck around. What I should have done is said, thank you very much, and stood to the side because people were standing up. And I like to think, wow, because me, no, it's because of the topic. This is the humbling part. People want to talk about mental health. They just don't know how. Here comes this guy on stage that lost two brothers. They stood up. My wife said that. Christine, she was in the audience. She goes, you should, you should have stuck around. They stood up. And watch me bolt right here. Thank you. There you go. You got to thank the sponsors. You got to thank the sponsors. I'm going to stop sharing. Hopefully you can see me. So there it is. Sorry about that. That talk at the end, I normally don't watch it to the end. 
um, because of my brothers. He gets me every time. But there you go. The director's cut. Dennis Gillen talking about it. Dennis Gillen uh, talking about his life. So you're now hopefully inspired because you have a story to tell. Everybody does. Everybody's recovering from something and everybody loves a good comeback. I need you to tell your story. And if you need help telling it, find me, call me, leave a comment in the section. There are millions of folks out there, TEDx coaches, whatever. I'll, I'll guide you through the process, no problem. By the way, little thing I learned while doing this talk, you can buy views, which is total bull crap. You know that? You can, an, an advertising agency approached me and said, hey, you're at 27,000, which I'm super proud of. They said, you want to get the 40,000? You want to get the 60,000? We can help. Pay money. We broke the internet, folks. We just did. <laughs> it's just the way it is. We broke it. Um, but I'm very pleased with 27,000. We'll get to 30, whatever. One person needs to hear it. If one person hears it and acts on it, we're good. And um, I want to thank you all for sticking with me this far. That's that's the TEDx talk. And you, my friend, have one in you. Find me and I'll coach you through it.